welcome to Single Path. I have a very special episode for you guys today because I have with me the world's fastest production oscilloscope. This is the Agilent DSA X series, particularly model 96204Q. It offers 62 gigahertz of analog bandwidth and 160 giga samples per second on two dedicated channels. That's 160 billion samples per second from its A to D converters, which means that when both of the channels are enabled, the instrument is processing over 2.5 terabits per second of information, which is really, really impressive. Now, unlike traditional oscilloscopes, the dedicated inputs, the, high, the very high frequency inputs, are separated from the regular inputs. So this instrument also has four channels that are able to run at 80 giga samples per second and have 33 gigahertz of analog bandwidth. That alone is really impressive also, let alone the 62 gigahertz dedicated inputs. And as it is configured, because it has every conceivable option that's on it, including the memory and tons of different kind of software, this is worth about half a million dollars. On its own, it doubles the value of the house that's in it. So it's a very expensive and a very specialized instrument. It's not something that you would find in any laboratory. It's intended for very specific use. Only if you really need to digitize 62 gigahertz of bandwidth and on two channels would you purchase something like this. But anyhow, this is the most expensive thing that's ever been in my house, half a million dollars. So let's uh, take a look at it. Let's look at the front panel. We'll talk about how it works. I'll show you the block diagram. I have some interesting experiments set up that we can put it to the test and see what it does. So here's the front of the instrument. So let me take the, the front cover, protective cover off. Here we go. So this is the Azure DSAX 96204Q and it says 160 giga samples per second and 62 gigahertz of bandwidth. So the first thing you notice is that it has a very large display which occupies pretty much the entire front of the instrument. It's a touch screen. I like, I like instruments that have a very large high resolution display because you can see easily what you're doing and uh, even if you're sitting a little bit further away from, from the unit itself. The other thing you notice right away is that it has the four dedicated inputs that I was talking about. Each of these inputs has a 33 gigahertz of bandwidth and offers 80 giga samples per second. And they have to use K connectors for these because they have to have 30 gigahertz of bandwidth at least. And Agilent has also equipped these connectors with this plastic gray ring that you see around them, which is this uh, patented design where you can tighten these by hand and once you reach the appropriate torque they begin to click and skip so instead of having to use a torque wrench every time you tighten one of these you can use these guys to do it and it's very convenient so you don't have to bring the big torque wrench every time close to the display and close to the unit and next to each of the RF connectors you can see there's a DC connector and these DC connectors are used to power the probes you can connect to the instrument directly so you can have an active probe uh, that has up to 33 gigahertz of bandwidth directly from Agilent and that's a high impedance probe so you can sno uh, snoop onto a maybe a trace of a line on a PCB or something where you want to look at some uh, data coming up that disturbing the line you can purchase those high, high impedance probe and they connect directly onto here and they can communicate with the oscilloscope with these connectors and you can have calibration factors and attenuation factors and so on so it's very convenient the system uh, is well thought out and on the right side, you can see the, the real edge connectors, the two dedicated 62 gigahertz of bandwidth connectors on the other side. These guys are V connectors, so they support up to 62 gigahertz of bandwidth very easily. And I have put two female to female V to V converters here, so I don't screw and unscrew connectors directly onto the instrument. These are kind of like a sacrificial connector to protect these. Uh, from damage so you don't want to continuously use these up and the rest of the day, this design of the front panel is really flattened so that all the buttons are very clicky and they don't stick out they're totally flush with the front it gives it a very nice look and you don't accidentally press something that you don't want to press and it has a whole bunch of other optical decoded knobs where you can you know they, they of course they permanently rotate and they are color coded for the different channels and when you enable the real edge only one and three can be turned on and if the real edge is turned off then all four channels can be used so let's turn this guy on here we go so it uses a special power cable that comes with the instrument itself because the power consumption is so high you cannot connect any power cable to the back of the unit so don't try to do that if you have, happen to have one of these uh, in your lab so it has to have at least a minimum of 10 amps available to it in order for it to run, which is a lot of power consumption. All those ADCs and FPGAs that are inside it burn a lot of power. It runs, of course, Microsoft Windows 7, and this particular one, I think, has an SSD in it. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but they do come with SSDs anyway. So it's going to take a little bit of time for this guy to boot up. You can see all the front panel buttons lit up, and they're all color-coded. So it will take a bit of time to come up, and then uh, let's see what it looks like. 
here we go the instrument is now loaded I have uh, loaded the default setups on default setups the real edge is disabled and we are just looking at channel 1 so that channel 1 is this channel 1 and I can turn the other channels on channel 2, channel 3 and channel 4 so now there are all these four channels are enabled and on each of them we're getting 80 giga samples per second and 33 gigahertz of bandwidth so let's take a look at for example the noise floor of the instrument on one of the channels so let me turn the other channels off here we go so let's uh, change the time division a little bit so we can capture a few more points so now I'm capturing eight mega points at 80 giga samples per second let's change the vertical resolution let's go down to uh, let's say five milliwatt per division uh, is a good is a good place to start so let's do some measurements uh, let's measure the peak to peak value of the noise here we go so it's telling me that the peak to peak value of the noise is 6.3 millivolt on this channel at a 5 millivolt per division setting 33 gigahertz of bandwidth and 80 giga samples per second which is really impressive let's measure the RMS value so I go under measure and I can measure so many different things here and there's voltage time clock data all kind of uh, different kind of measurements so let's go under voltage under voltage let's choose volts RMS and we're saying on a single cycle and it's DC is included and its unit is in volts here we go so now it's doing that measurement and it's giving that measurement to me here so it's measuring about 650 microvolt RMS on a single channel with a 33 gigahertz bandwidth which is very very impressive this is a very low amount of noise floor and this is the reason why it is capable of having better than seven effective number of bits at such ridiculous sample rates so let me now enable the real edge and, and see the, the noise at its highest sampling rate and its highest bandwidth. So if I press real edge, then it will revert to its real edge settings. And now real edge is on one volt per division. So let me change that also. Let me go down to the same setting. Now it's at five millivolt per division and it's going to start doing some measurements. Here we go. So now it's giving me something around 795 microvolts and it's now jumping up a little bit so it says the mean is about 1 millivolt of RMS noise and about 12.5 millivolt of peak to peak noise at 62.3 gigahertz of bandwidth and 160 giga samples per second I can of course enable the other channel also that will be channel number 3 and I can do exactly the same thing and have the same settings now this is the highest configuration essentially of the instrument where I have both channels running at 160 giga samples per second at 62.3 gigahertz of bandwidth but the noise is about 1 millivolt RMS which is what also the data sheet reports the data sheet says that the noise floor of the instrument at 10 millivolt per division is 1 millivolt RMS so it, it is it looks like it is correct and it's meeting its specification remember that I'm measuring this at 5 millivolt per division and not at 10 millivolt per division so let's take a look at a little bit about about the instrument itself so we can see what we're talking about so this is the uh, the model DSO X96204Q as I mentioned before and it's running software revision 4.50.0005 and it has some FPGA functions a version on it and so on and it's running Windows 7 but if you look at the installed options here on the left there is no end to this list this list just keeps going it has everything 10 gigabit Ethernet, USB, um, HDMI, PCI Express uh, display port, um, all kind of different memory configurations it has different kind of Ethernet compliance uh, DVI, HDMI, wireless USB, USB 3 some fiber channels, SFP Plus, SD cards and so on, SATA, SATA 3 and you know, the list just keeps going because every possible option is installed on this but the beauty of these options is that if you're working on one of these particular protocols you can purchase the software for that protocol and the instrument will tell you everything you want to know about your your circuits, its measurement performance, whether it meets the compliance, whether it meets the requirements but if there is an error it can tell you where that error came from which, if it was in a frame, if it was in an edge, if it was in a, some kind of a packet it will do everything for you because it has so much data by doing such high sampling rate that you won't miss anything if you're working with one of these protocols this also of course has the the, the highest uh, amount of memory in it so if I go under setup and if I go under acquisition you can see that if I go under, ma under manual I can just continuously increase this memory all the way up to two, 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 gigasat, 2 billion points of memory which can be done on a per channel basis so you can you can see that as well 
and you can have you can see that you will you can fix the sampling rate right now it's fixed at 160 giga samples per second but you can choose to sample at any any rate that you want and you can whether have interpolation or not on your data so if you like to see only the data points the instrument captures you can do that you don't have to allow the instrument to do interpolation for you so anyhow enough about that let's connect something to it and see what happens so before we do any experiments, let's try and figure out how this instrument actually works. So here I have the block diagram of the unit itself, uh, which I've taken from the service manual that's available on Agilent's website. So if you look at this block diagram, on the right side, we have this little portion here, which is the front panel assembly, and this just takes care of the USB, the display, the touch, you know, the touch screen controller, and the probe i squared c to USB converter, which is a little con connector that I showed you in order to be able to talk to the active probe, and the probe power module, and so on. So this is very basic stuff that's just to control in the front panel, so we can forget about that. At the bottom right, we have the oscillator board. This is where the 10 megahertz reference comes in and out of the instrument as well as the 100 megahertz reference. Now most instruments use a 10 megahertz reference in order to lock their oscillators to another instrument's oscillator, but for this very, very high sampling rate and very phase sensitive uh, instruments like this oscilloscope or other uh, high-end arbitrary waveform generators, they, they use on top of that 100 megahertz reference that you can use to even better uh, phase lock this unit to another unit. So all the signal that is generated by the oscillator board from the references or the internal references, they're fed to the 10 gigahertz and 32 gigahertz uh, dielectric resonance oscillator based PLLs. And that's where the high frequency 10 gigahertz and 32 gigahertz signals are generated, locked to of course the oscillator board's reference that is fed to all the ADCs and the real edge uh, module that I will show you in a second. So now the signal coming from the, uh, the DROs to go to the real edge as well as to these four acquisition boards. So, each of, so there is four different acquisition boards inside the main uh, backplane assembly of the oscilloscope. That's where the four channels of the oscilloscope, uh, the front ones, are actually fed to. If you look carefully here, there's channel 1, channel 2, channel 3, and channel 4. Those are the main four inputs that work at 80 giga samples per second. And all four of them go through a, a, a four coax attenuators. Now these are a relay based uh, uh, attenuators that can set the range on the oscilloscope's vertical input. So remember that these guys use a, an actual mechanical att attenuator to make sure that they get the exact correct level uh, of signal reaching uh, the ADCs because they want to make sure that they don't overload the ADC and they want to make sure that there is not too much attenuation inside the ADC. Uh, before the signal gets there because the ADCs have a very well-defined um, optimum input level that they have to receive to, to be able to provide you with the highest effective number of bits. So there is four of those boards and each of those boards is going to be capable of doing 80 giga samples per second. So there's four of them, that's 80 giga samples per second. So two of them can give you 160 giga samples per second in order to reach uh, the highest sampling rate. So these four inputs coming from the four channels. And then there is also the inputs coming from the two dedicated inputs, the high speed inputs that have 62 gigahertz of bandwidth. These guys don't directly go to the ADCs. They first go through a pair of real edge modules and then the output of the real edge modules is fed to two of the ADCs at a time. So if I follow this signal path, no pun intended, here's the channel 1 going in here, goes to the real edge module and then there is two outputs coming out of the real edge module and those two outputs go into two of the acquisition boards and the other two acquisition board inputs come from the other real edge. Now why would they do this? Now think about the architecture of the sampling here for a moment. We have four modules, four uh, boards, each of them doing 80 giga samples per second. If I want to do 160 giga samples per second, then on one clock cycle, I will use one of the boards, and on the other half of the clock cycle, I will use the other boards. So the sampling goes back and forth between these two boards. That's how you get 160 giga samples per second from 80 gigahertz, uh, giga samples per second ADCs. This is a time interleaving technique, which is very common, it's done all the time. Anyhow, even the ADCs inside these modules are heavily time interleaved themselves, and I'll talk about that. So we can time interleave two 80 giga samples per second ADCs to get 160 giga samples per second ADCs at 8 bit of resolution. Now, in order to be able to do this time interleaving with very sensitive and very well controlled edges of the data and the clock, 
that's how they have to, that's why they've built this real edge now they don't tell you exactly what's in it but we can take a guess most likely it is a very high bandwidth very very precise track handled amplifier that holds the signal steady for half the period while the signal is jumping back and forth between the 280 the sample per second ADCs. Now whether it's doing that exactly at 80 gigahertz or whether it's doing it at a lower rate, I can't be sure. I, have, I wasn't able to find out. But regardless, the, the architecture of the time interleaving ADC demands that there be some very per high precision edge defined circuit that can give you this track and hold behavior. Remember the track and hold behavior holds the signal constant for a certain duration so the ADC can go through the entire process of conversion to digital while the next sample is being prepared. So that's why this is the way it is. So the four inputs go to the four modules or two of the modules at a time are driven by a single real edge in order to be able to uh, give, give you 160 giga samples per second. And everything else is you know, the calibrations, the interpolators for the memory, the FPGA and the clock distribution that basically the clocks, all these ADCs are all built also on the backplane assembly. Everything else is fairly straightforward. The thing that I want you to take away from this is the, the very big picture of the architecture and how they get 160 giga samples per second from two 80 giga, 80 giga sample per second um, boards. But these boards themselves are actually quite complicated. So I have the block diagram for one of them. That's right here. Let me see if I can get this thing into display properly. Here we go. So this is one of uh, those acquisition boards. So here's the real edge. So you can see one of the real edges is actually two of those boards. They're called the oak modules. So this real edge goes, one of the outputs goes into one of these um, acquisition boards. And the acquisition boards has a front end, which itself is a sampler and a preamplifier and the triggers that go in and out because remember the trigger circuitry on the oscilloscope is different from the ADC circuitry. The, tri the trigger circuitry is a separate module itself and you can see after the preamplifier you go into a trigger module and the trigger module on this scope has more than 20 gigahertz of bandwidth on edge triggering so you can edge trigger on signals that are you know above 20 gigahertz which is really impressive. So the sampler then here prepares the signal through again a, another track handled amplifier for the four ADCs that are on each of the OAK modules. So each of the 80 giga sample per second ADCs themselves are time interleaved. And each of these ADCs are themselves again time interleaved. So it's multiple layers of time interleaving ADCs. Nobody builds ADCs that are running more than, you know, maybe a 10 giga sample per second on a single slice. Most people build them out of time interleaved components. So we have four time interleaved ADCs that make 80 giga sample per second. We take two of those to get 160 giga sample per second. So there's multiple levels of that. You can appreciate how important the clocking mechanism of all these ADCs have to be because they have to be perfectly aligned to each other in order to be able to give you that really well-defined edges and the samples and the clocks lined up so you can get your uh, conversion. If there is a phase difference between the clock that's feeding these ADCs and that's more than a certain amount, if there is jitter on the clock on these ADCs, there is no way you're going to get 8 bits of resolution and better than 7 bits of effective number of bits coming out of the ADCs themselves. So you can see this four of, four of the outputs of the ADCs, each of them go into this memory conditioner circuitry which then is able to store the real-time data coming from these ADCs directly onto the memory. So if four of these make 80 giga samples per second, each of these must be 20 giga samples per second. And each of these themselves is another time interleave ADC, if I'm not mistaken. I think that they're making these ADCs out of silicon germanium, and the memory is, of course, CMOS. So we have silicon germanium by CMOS process they use to build the ADCs, but they use an indium phosphide process to make the real edge circuitry. And they have, Agilent has its, ha, have their own indium phosphide process, which by now must be uh, hitting 400 gigahertz FDNF max of the, trend, of the transistors themselves. So they make the really, really high speed, really high dynamic range, low noise track and amplifier front ends in indium phosphide, and then they go into a silicon germanium uh, by CMOS analog to digital converter and sampler and so on uh, in order to get to the ADCs. They can't build the ADCs from indium phosphide because indium phosphide's level of integration can't match CG and silicon in general. So that's why they do it 
this way. But here now we have a very good idea of how they do this. If you are going from the front, if you're coming from a front panel, you go through a preamp, you go through a track and an amplifier, you drive four ADCs. And if you're coming from the special inputs, you go through the real edge, you go through the preamp again, and then from this you go to yet another board which will be sitting on top of this, and two of those will give you 160 giga samples per second. And there's actually a picture of that. I wish I could take this apart, but if I take this uh, half a million dollar oscilloscope apart, the nitrogen is going to show up on my house. So I can't take it apart, but I can show you kind of a, th a 3D drawing of what it looks like on the inside. Here's the four acquisition boards, one, two, three, four. Even you can see, even they show the heat sinks here. And I think these four are the four ADCs. It's one, two, three, four. The four ADCs, one, two, three, four. The four memories or the memory conditioners, and I believe all these are the memory. So uh, you can see exactly how it is constructed. I even have a picture of the real edge module. Here we go, from Agilent's uh, marketing material. Oh, let me see if I can get this zoomed in. Here it is. This is the real edge module. I believe these are the clock, and this is the input, and this is the output. So you can uh, connect this. This is what sits in front of uh, that block diagram that I showed you that would be this guy right here. This guy then drives these four two of these modules at the same time, and that would be from this circuit. And he has to receive a 32 gigahertz uh, DRO PLLs inputs, which I believe go in from here. I don't know which port is what, but I'm assuming that that's the case. And here I have, the, I have pictures of the uh, ADCs. So here is their own custom-made package ADC board, and this is the real edge board. So this must be the track handle the amplifier uh, component that sits inside this module at the top. So this, let me go up here. So there's, there's one of these, I believe, in here. And this is the ADC board. Now you can't see much detail in here, unfortunately, but uh, this is a fully custom made package that Agilent has made. You can see it's a BGA package, and it has every conceivable trick on it. So this thick line that you see here, this looks like it's raised. That's a micro coax that is actually a, a coax that they have manufactured inside the package. So there's a ground completely surrounding the trays to, to emulate a coax cable, to give you tons of bandwidth. This must be the input, or I'm sorry, these are the two inputs from the two channels. And then uh, I believe the track and amplifiers must be here and the ADC must be here. I don't know exactly what is what because I don't tell you. And there is two ICs here, which, I, which might be the, the clock generators and so on. But this blue stuff that you see here is this custom thermal paste that they have developed in order to take all this heat from this A to D converters out of this package. But you can, by looking at this, you can get quickly an idea about how they've manufactured this, how they distribute their signal, how they have the sensitive stuff in micro coax any other really fancy stuff there's a reason why these things cost half a million dollar because there's just a remarkable amount of development that's gone into it and there's a bunch of other stuff that I, you know if you're really really interested I recommend that you take a look at here's the DRO structure the 10 the 10 gigahertz that goes out is a 32 gigahertz DRO and there's you know different kind of references that come in and out of the board but really the main thing to take away is how the signal is distributed and how you can achieve 160 giga samples per second by using lower speed ADCs and how how they have uh, uh, routed the signal through and in the, the front end inputs also have coax attenuators. These are 67 gigahertz uh, relay based attenuators that you can hear them as you change the, the, the levels, the vertical levels of the oscilloscope. But again, very impressive uh, design and it works and it, it meets the specification. So let's uh, play with it. Well, the question is what do we connect to something like this? I mean, sampling. A signal, let's say a signal at 60 gigahertz. Sure, you can do that. You'll see a sine, sine form, sine wave, and nothing interesting comes out of that. So what I've decided to do as the first experiment is to connect to it this box. So this is a a data generator, particularly is a 56 gigabit per second PRBS source. So it's able to generate 56 gigabit per second of NRZ, which is non-return to zero pulses that come out of the front. So this is used to test communication systems and so on. This is from a company called Centelax. That company doesn't exist anymore. It was purchased by Agilent. So now this, this instrument's part number is N4975A. So you can look it up on the Agilent website and Agilent is going to repackage this and you know, put the Agilent logo on it and provide you the support that comes with Agilent and so on. So you're gonna be able to see something like this coming from Agilent later. Well, I have this, uh, this was bought from Centalax uh, while Centalax was still in business on their own. So let's connect this little guy 
uh, to the instrument and see what happens. Again, as always with very high speed, very sensitive instruments, you have to have proper precautions before you connect it to anything. So what I've done here is that I have connected, this guy has two V connectors that come out of the output of the instrument and I have connected two DC uh, coupling caps to it, to this DC blocks in the front and there is a termination on one side of it and the other side is now open and I'm going to connect the other side directly to the instrument. Again, I'm ESD shielded, grounded, and, uh, and I know that I will not damage the instrument by that. So you have to make sure that you know what you're doing. So I'm going to connect, I'm going to use channel three of the oscilloscope as the trigger, and we will see why in a moment. Make sure that I do this properly. And I'm going to connect the other end of this to the clock output of this box. So this box provides clock output directly from the instrument as well so you can use that for synchronization and so on so we're going to connect that up I'm going to use a torque wrench to tighten these guys and a torque wrench in this one perfect I don't need to over tighten them and I'm using here a V cable which I have to of course because I'm trying to pass 56 gigabit per second of data through it this is not a very good cable so this is going to degrade the eye quality and we will see that once we start to capture it. There we go, that goes there. And this one goes here. Perfect. So now we have everything connected. I'm gonna tighten this just enough to make sure that it is connected. That should be good enough for now. There we go. There it is, so let's turn this guy on. And let's start adjusting the scope to see if we get anything at all. Oh, I'm connecting this one. I'm already making a mistake. So you have to turn the real edge on because I'm connecting to the real edge input. Let's go down to 100 millivolt per division. There we go. There it is. Here's the data. Of course, you're seeing the data overlapping because we are triggering on the rising edge of the data. So if I take a single capture, you can see all the bits. You know, there's two ones in a row, here's a zero, here's a one, and here's a one zero one zero pattern. So I, every time I do single capture, of course, you're going to see a different portion of the waveform because this is generating two to the 15 PRBS sequence and we're looking at a very small portion of that. So let's run that and now let's enable channel three as well. And on channel three, we should see the clock. There it is. So if I turn channel one off and I trigger on channel three, you will see the clock coming out. I can measure the frequency of the clock. I know that this clock is at half the data rate. So I expect it to be around 28 gigahertz. And I can go measure, I can go time, and I can go, no, I don't want that. I want frequency. There we go. So it's gonna measure the frequency. It says about, you can see here, is about 27, 28 gigahertz, which is correct. So let me turn the channel on again, change the time division, let me erase the marker, turn channel three off, here we go. Now I'm triggering on the clock, which is why you're seeing a nice waveform uh, with individual eye diagrams. Again, if I do a single capture, you can see different various bits come and go. So this looks all nice and everything. What can I do with this? Well, one of the things I can do with it is I can start changing the display function and give it a color grading. There we go. So by giving it a color grading, you can actually begin to see the eye diagram form on the display and be able to tell which portions of the eye have uh, some imperfections. For example, I can see that there is a lot of uh, vertical noise here on the one and a lot of vertical noise on the on the zero, I can see that there's quite a bit of ISI and there's quite a bit of jitter happening um, uh, between each of these eyes and you can see the white hot spots are the regions where the waveform is repeating most often. So let's do some basic measurements on this eye diagram. I can go under measure and I can go under eye, eye pattern and I can do measurements like eye height, eye width, the jitter, and the crossing percentage and the quality factor. So let's measure the jitter on the eye and let's measure it in an RMS value. Here we go. So it's telling me that the jitter of this eye diagram is 715 femtoseconds, which is pretty good for an RMS jitter for an eye at 56 gigabit per second, but the peak to peak jitter is quite a bit higher. So let's measure again. Measure eye pattern 
eye jitter and this time I'm going to measure it peak to peak. So the peak to peak value is 4.29 uh, picosecond. And again, there's a lot of ISI on this eye because of the long cable and the poor, poor quality of the cable that I'm using. But let's also measure the eye quality factor. So we can have that. I'm going to leave the default settings on that. And the eye quality factor is about 6, which is okay for, for again, for an eye diagram like that. Now, these type of measurements you can do on any eye diagram, even with a scope that is subsampling. So remember, this is a DSAX. The DCAX uh, can do eye diagrams like this also, but it's a subsampling oscilloscope. What this can do, because it is a real-time scope, is to be able to give you jitter and noise decomposition of your data, even if your data is not periodic. So, be, so if you have an arbitrary data stream, or if you have a data stream that is very, very long and it has a very long periodicity, for example, maybe a 2 to the 31 PRBS sequence, and you don't have enough memory in any other oscilloscope to capture uh, the entire pattern to be able to do jitter decomposition, you can do jitter decomposition on this on a portion of your waveform that is not periodic. That's a really important feature. If you're familiar with this type of analysis, you would know what I'm talking about. Because if I go under this uh, jitter noise uh, analysis uh, setup that it has, you can see here at the bottom, I can tell it that, yes, that the signal is periodic. And I can choose uh, among a whole bunch of different periodic signals you know, to do the 7 PRBS. And I can go keep going higher to do the 11, to do the 12, to do the 14. So I can have all kind of different periodic signals. Or I can have a totally arbitrary signal. And in an arbitrary signal, I can still do jitter decomposition. I can still analyze the jitter <clears throat> of all the edges of the data that's coming in without having to store the entire waveform in memory. So this is, a, again, a feature of a real-time scope that has such a high sampling rate that I can do this on a 56 giga per second data without having any, uh, any problems. So the next thing I want to do is I want to introduce some uh, purposely damage the eye and then see, see this guy capture that in real time and so we can look at how the waveform looks like when the eye is being um, tempered with. So let me start that. So this instrument, the Centralix PRBS generator, has an, has an output retimer which retimes the data as it, just as it is about to exit the instrument. And I have control over the phase of that uh, retimer and I can change that in order to actually retime the data in, in, a, in an incorrect way and cause metastable regions in the eye diagram. So I'm going to do that right now. And if you look at the eye diagram, I should be able to cause some major problems with it. Let me go, let me clear the display. So we can see at some point, I'm going to begin to totally destroy the eye. There we go, it's almost there, there it is. There you go, there it is, I got it. So there we go. So now you can see that I have changed the retimer phase and this is causing some major problems in the eye. You can see how some of the bits are completely destroyed while some of the other ones don't have as many errors in them. So if I go on to, if I remove the color grading, you can see occasionally if I do a single capture and we may be able to find one that is bad, although it's going to be pretty difficult to see. Oh boy, that's going to take a while before I can catch one of those. But you can, you can occasionally see one of the bits crossing in the middle of the eye while the other bits are behaving correctly. Let me see. I really want to capture one of those so you can see it. Especially because this is in real time. Let me go. Keep going until we find one that looks really bad. There's a fairly good example of it. Here we go. Here's one. You can see that this bit is completely out of place uh, as opposed to reaching the low level as these guys are reaching. Remember, the, the, the fact that this is much higher than this is due to ISI. That's a different problem. But this particular one is due to the fact that we are making a retiming mistake and it's, and it's much, much higher than the other value. If I continue on, I should be able to see even more of them. Here's one. Here's a good example. This bit is completely out of place because the retimer is um, causing causing it not to be able to reach the highest value. Again, if you have to be familiar with this type of signaling to know exactly what I'm talking about. But this is the first time you can see something like this. Uh, you can see the imperfections 
of the bits directly in live in real time because of the fact that you have such a high sampling rate and you're able to see it in real time as opposed to only in the eye diagram mode which we were looking at before. I mean in the eye diagram mode these things can be seen using other types of scopes as well but here to be able to see it directly in real time is very impressive. So for example let's say that you have a problem where a particular bit is always misbehaving or a couple of bits are always misbehaving you can capture this in real time and then bring the data out and find out which bit is causing the problem even if your signal is not periodic. Here we go, now I have changed the phase so much that the eye diagram is almost completely gone and if I were to disable the the color grading you can see how there are many many lines going right through the eye again this is at 56 gigabit per second you're seeing this live and if I do a single capture on that you can see how horrible the the bits are going to look like I mean you can take a look you can see this guy at all not at all makes it through the halfway point and, and same as this one you can see continuous bits totally this bit is totally missing the zero crossing altogether this guy just barely makes it over the zero crossing this guy just reaches it so you can have a very good idea about what is causing the problem and I can capture I can do something like this and then zoom into it and then span it so because it is so much memory uh, this scope has so much memory I can capture ton and ton of data and just go left and right and I have tons of uh, resolution I, for example I can do you know I can go all the way up to here this is 32 million points I do a single capture on that and then I can go all the way in and see each individual bit again in real time very very impressive for 56 gigabit per second data rates. Here we go and I've adjusted the phase again and brought the, the diagram back to normal so we can see all the different if I go back to measuring the some of the measurements on the uh, eye quality and the eye jitter we should be able to get roughly the jitter that we had before there you go about 700 frames per second so we're back to normal like we had it before. So here's a, a quick example of uh, displaying 56 gigabit per second signals and seeing all kind of analysis you can do on it and seeing imperfections of the data directly live as it happens. So let's move on to the next experiment. So for our next experiment I wanted to do something unusual. So because the oscilloscope has so much bandwidth, it has uh, 62 gigahertz of bandwidth, it can act as uh, the world's largest bandwidth software defined radio. So in a sense you can digitize a sequence of data up to 62 gigahertz worth of bandwidth and it, it can then demodulate various data within that bandwidth. So uh, you could have a, a whole bunch of different uh, sequences of data at different carrier frequencies from DC to 62 gigahertz, all of them superimposed at the same time and the scope can demodulate all of them in real time uh, simultaneously. So well, I want to demonstrate some of that and show you the, the capability of the oscilloscope. So what I have in mind is to do the following. I have two sources of data that are PRBS generators, PRBS 7 and PRBS 9. These are going to come from my FPGA board that you've seen in some of the previous videos and they're going to come at a 3.125 gigabit per second. So if you think about it, the uh, frequency content of the PRBS uh, sequence, I have already shown that in one of my previous videos, so I recommend that you go and look at that if you, if you don't know about it. But in, in particular, a 3.125 gigabit per second sequence is going to have a frequency content that's going to look something like this, where it's going to have a null uh, right there at the data rate, so at about 3.1 gigahertz right there. So this is the frequency content of a PRBS sequence. So it starts from DC and goes up to mostly about 3.1 gigahertz. That's the, the majority of the power is in that portion of the spectrum. And I have another one down here that's a different sequence. It's a 2 to the 9 PRBS sequence. It also has a similar spectrum con spectral content. It's going to look just like that. It's just a different sequence. And this one is going to be also at 3.15 gigahertz or so. So I'm going to take these two I'm going to feed these PRBS sequences directly to two double sideband mixers and these mixers are going to up convert the frequency content of this PRBS sequence around the local oscillator frequency that's being fed to them. Now these are double sideband mixers so they don't have image rejection and the spectrum is going to be mirrored around the LO frequency. The LO frequency of the mixers are going to be generated using two YIG oscillators. These are yttrium iron garnet oscillators which are magnetically tuned as opposed to uh, other type of oscillators which are tuned by a voltage. So they're a little bit different but anyhow that's for a different tutorial. So these YIG oscillators I'm going to have one of them tuned to 20 GHz and the other one tuned to 40 GHz. 
So one of these LOs is going to go to the top mixer, mixer number one, and the other LO is going to go to the bottom mixer, mixer number two. So this spectrum that you see up here is going to get up converted to 20 gigahertz using this first mixer. So this output of this first mixer is going to look something like this. It's going to have some LO like that. That LO is going to sit at 20 gigahertz and it's going to have the spectrum of the PRBS sequence mirrored on both sides of it. So that's going to be the output of the first mixer using a 20 gigahertz LO and a PRBS sequence at its input. This one is going to have exactly the same thing except that it has a carrier frequency of 40 gigahertz. So that one's going to sit around 40 gigahertz and it's going to up convert uh, the spectrum just like that. So this spectrum is going to get up converted here. Again, this is a double sideband mixer. There is no image reject. So the spectrum is going to be mirrored on both sides of the LO. And then I'm going to use these three resistors, which is of course inside a power combiner of a microwave power combiner, which I've shown you before. And it's going to look like one of these guys basically. So that's going to sum the output of the two mixers together and it's going to go to the oscilloscope. So this spectrum here, remember these are all linear circuits, so these resistors are of course linear, so I, what, what I expect to see uh, going into the scope is two up-converted signals, one of them sitting at 40G, the other one sitting at 20G with the spectrum of the PRBS sequences around it, like so. Now, if I were to look at this data that's going to the oscilloscope in time domain, it's just going to look like a mess because it's going to have this PRBS sequence up converted, this PRBS sequence up converted, all added together. There's going to be LO leakage, there's going to be IF leakage, there's going to be nonlinearities and tones everywhere. So it's going to be just a nightmare in time domain. But if I look at it in the frequency domain, I should be able to see something like this. And because the oscilloscope has so much bandwidth, it can capture this entire chunk of data up to 62 gigahertz, which I don't even need, I'm only going up to 40 something, maybe 45 gigahertz or so. But anyhow, you can capture it all the way up to 62 gigahertz, and then I can apply DSP to it and remove this portion that is of interest to me and isolate it, and, and also this portion that is of interest to me, isolate it, and then recover my original data back. So my oscilloscope is going to act as not only the receiver, but also the down conversion, the filtering, the DSP, and the recovery of the data, the clock and data recovery of the data, everything is going to be done in the DSP domain because I have digitized this entire bandwidth simultaneously. I can recover both of these at the same time. If I were to do this using microwave techniques, I would need to split this into two again after I receive it. I need to split it into two, filter one around 20 gigahertz, filter the other one at 40 gigahertz, make sure I filter the images, make sure I filter the LO feed through. I'm going to have to have very nice sharp filters in microwave to be able to recover this data. But with the oscilloscope, digitizing this entire band, I can remove that and I can do the SP and I can remove the data simultaneously, all within the entire bandwidth of the oscilloscope, which is really impressive and an unusual thing to do. But again, it shows exactly what the oscilloscope can do and it can show its capabilities to be used as a true software defined radio with ridiculous amount of bandwidth. So let me explain to you how this setup works. So here's my FPGA board. We've seen this board before. This uses a Vertex 2 Pro and is capable of generating the 3.125 gigabit per second data that I want on multiple of its transceivers. So I'm using two of its transceivers. So here's transceiver number one and here's transceiver number two's outputs. You can see that I have loopback cables. These cables go from the output of the trans transmitter to the input of the receiver directly on the board itself. So the, uh, the PGA can synchronize and tell me that the link is active. There is the other one for the other channel. There is DC decoupling caps and uh, termination resistors on the ports that are not being used. And these are the two outputs. Uh, the channel 1 PRBS and channel 2 PRBS that I am using. Both of those come into this uh, little contraption that I have built here. So let me get a chair and... Uh, show you a little bit a, a close view of what I'm talking about. Here we go. So let me just give you a close-up view on here. So you can see again the DC decoupling caps that are here, the termination resistor that is on this side with the DC decoupling cap again, and the two cables come out here and they go into these two EGA oscillators. So Here's the first EGA oscillator, here's the second EGA oscillator. Both of these EGA oscillators can be tuned anywhere from 20 to 40 gigahertz. And you can see on the top, what I've done is that I've connected their ground together. 
This is the two ground cables coming from the egositors connected together. There's the VDD, the 15 volt VDD of both of them shared together. And the negative terminal of their tuning port are also connected together. So the power supply of the egositor, which is this guy, just the 15 volts to turn on the, the core, the resonator on. Uh, that one comes all the way from here. That's set to 15 volts, it's drawing 166 milliamps. That's the first thing. Uh, the other two, which are connected to the magnetic coils of the uh, the um, giga oscillators, here's the first one, here's the second one, here's the ground, they come from my adjuvant supply that is sitting on this side. I actually cannot turn on anything on the other side of the lab, because if I turn on anything else, it's going to trip the fuse. Uh, this, this guy is going to take the entire power. I turned it off right now because it was heating up the room too much. I have to turn it back on a little bit later. So. Uh, here, you can see this is the output of the ego oscillator, right here. It goes into this mixer. This is a mixer right here, made from, uh, this is a MyTech mixer. The part number for it is uh, TB04401W1 um, or LW1. And yeah, you can take a look. Let me see if I can zoom in here for those of you who might be interested to go and look, look up this data sheet. I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, here we go. There it is. So there is the, uh, the first mixer, here's the second mixer, here are the IF signals going into the mixer, the LOs are of course coming from the egocitators, and then the output of the two mixers coming out of these two white cables are combined in this power combiner, which you've seen from my, one of my previous videos, and the output of the power combiner goes directly onto the first channel of the oscilloscope. So if I give you a bird's eye view of everything, and then of course the FPGA board is controlled by the laptop, which is sitting right here. And uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that I do all my schematics that I show you on my website uh, from uh, this online tool from circuitlab.com. Uh, circuit so you can see in the top left uh, the address there. So circuitlab.com has, uh, has given me actually and upgraded my account so I can do more fancy drawing for you guys. So I wanted to thank them for that. And go ahead and check them out if you're not aware of them. You can simulate your circuits and you can uh, put all, create all kind, of, all kind of circuit diagrams and they have a very nice uh, interface to use. So uh, I draw all the circuit diagrams that I show on my website using their, uh, their uh, software. So here we go, this is a, again just a quick view of this. Here's my IF signals going to the two mixers. Here's the two giga oscillators generating 20 gigahertz and 40 gigahertz. The outputs are summed up together and they go to the oscilloscope just like the block diagram that I have shown you here. So you can do a one-to-one -one comparison. Here's the PRBS generators coming from these two channels. Here's the first mixer, second mixer up here. The two EGA are down here. This power combiner is this last piece that's here. And of course, the output goes to the scope here and the output goes to the scope there. So the only thing left to do is to turn this whole thing on, turn the scope back on and see if we actually get this, which is what we expect to see. So because it's very difficult to see something in the time domain, let's create a, a, an FFT uh, window, a proper FFT window using the oscilloscope's own software and that would allow us to be able to see the spectrum directly on the oscilloscope itself. Let me see if I can get this somewhat of a, this is much harder than it seems, a uh, reasonable view of the scope screen, here we go, that should be okay. So I'm going to go uh, to analyze and do a math and FFT. I'm going to apply, you can see there's tons and tons of functionality built into the scope. So let's go and say FFT magnitude. And I'm going to say display on, so it will show the FFT magnitude. Now I want to see the entire bandwidth of the signal. So I'm going to say, I, I want to see all this essentially all the way up to 65 gigahertz. So it starts at zero hertz. I can tell it to stop at 65 gigahertz which is just over the bandwidth of the oscilloscope itself. I'm going to set the resolution bandwidth to be something uh, more reasonable, maybe 100 kilohertz. So there's the resolution bandwidth. Let's say the reference level to minus, um, uh, let's say minus 65 dBm, which is very low. Here we go. And the scale is 10 dB per second. And here we go. So this, what you're seeing right now, is the FFT of the signal of the oscilloscope itself. So that's all those tones are the internal tones generated by the oscilloscope itself and the noise floor, floor of, the, of the system because I am not applying any signal yet. So let's go ahead and apply something. So we should be able to start seeing some tones. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the voltage on my power supply over there until the magnetic field is generated inside, sufficient magnetic field is present inside the egocitter and then it should start generating a tone for us. So let's do that. So I'm going to go up, 1 volt, 2 volts, 3 volts, 4, 5, 6, there we go. So at 6 volts, I'm sorry, at 5 volts, the egocitter is uh, taking 500 milliamps. Remember, this is what matters. This doesn't matter because it's magnetically tuned. So it's the magnetic field that matters. So it's the relationship of current to frequency in the egocitter is based on, uh, is, is linear as a function of current, not voltage. Anyhow, so we go back. We can see our, uh, our LO. Now, you can tell me, I guess I can make this an open question for everybody. Why am I seeing this LO signal coming out of the mixer? Where is that coming from? Because this is not this signal is not directly from the egocitter, it's coming from the mixer itself. So think about it. But anyhow, this will help us to find out what is the frequency. So I can say here use marker and I can I set up a peak search and minus 40 is good. So I can do a single conversion and then I will get a marker here. And the marker tells me that the frequency is 20.6 gigahertz. That's perfect. That can be our first frequency because I've only turned on one of the ego oscillators. Now you can see there is a second harmonic and even the third harmonic of the signal that is being measured. This right here is where the band of the scope ends and the software totally filters everything after that and there's a very strong filtering. So this is DC here, this is 65 gigahertz at the very end. So I'm going all the way up to uh, 62 and a half, you can see it, then it drops like a rock, which it has to because otherwise it's going to start having other problems. So you can see very clearly uh, the, the, the signal that's coming through, so it's my first tone. I measured it. Let me turn the time domain signal off because it's not very helpful. I'm just going to look at the FFT. So that's our first signal. So again, I'm going to do another single capture and you can see that it is minus, uh, it, it is a 20 gigahertz signal. So let's run this again and let's turn on the other channel and you can see the second and third harmonics. So let's go. Remember, these are not from the other these are not from the other Yiga oscillator. The other Yiga oscillator hasn't turned on yet. So I'm going to go to 4 and 5. Here's the other Yiga oscillator is kicking in. There it is. This is the main tone. That's the other tone of the Yiga oscillator. Let's keep going. 8, 9, uh, I don't know. Let's do some, some other frequency. Let's see what this, let me see what that is. Let me do a single. Move on. There is this. The second tone is at 36 gigahertz. That's fine. We can use 36 gigahertz. It doesn't matter. I just want to stay reasonably away from the other harmonics. But I can go even higher. So just to, just to prove to you that indeed we can go all the way up to 40 gigahertz. Where is it? There it is. There it is. This is now the other EG oscillator. It's sitting right next to the second harmonic of the first EG oscillator. So I'm going to do a single capture. And I'm going to, there you go, you can see it right there, 40.6 gigahertz. So you can go for, you can see these ego oscillators really do get tuned anywhere between, uh, any, can, can be tuned anywhere between 20 to 40 gigahertz. So let me run this again. And let's pick it a frequency where we are not so close to the second harmonic of the first one. Ah, this must be, yeah, this is okay. And yeah, we have a lot of freedom because we're doing whatever we want anyway. So there you go, 39 gigahertz. Fine, let's keep it at that. Now, the frequency of the ego oscillators are shifting. I'm going to keep that as an open question for you too and tell me why are these this frequencies already gone much higher than it used to be before. So you can, you can think about it and tell me why they're shifting. So let me bring it back. And there we go. There it is. So here's my first LO, here's my second LO coming from the mixers. And uh, I can turn both of them off, you can see. Both ego oscillators off both EEG oscillators on. So now let's go to the FPGA board and try to generate some pure VS sequences. So I have turned on the FPGA board. So now we can go to the laptop like so. And this is the interface of the FPGA software that is running right now on the computer. I hope that this is at least reasonably visible. So I can set up some parameters so I can prove to you that indeed it is doing what I'm expecting it to do. So first I'm going to select the package type. The package type is three. Don't worry about the little details. Then I'm going to go to uh, main menu. And then from there I'm going to go uh, set the rocket IR attributes. 
So there is, I know that I'm using MG2 and MG6. Again, you have to be familiar with these boards to follow these portions, but anyhow. So I'm gonna set it, so I'm gonna turn the preemphasis off. Uh, you can't see it, there it is. I'm turning the preemphasis off. Then I'm going to set the uh, voltage swing to the highest value possible. That is 800 millivolt. I'm gonna do the same thing for the other one. Turn the preemphasis on, set the highest amplitude possible. So now they are set up. Then I'm going to run the rocket IO birth test. So now it's going to generate the PRBS sequences for me and it's going to try to, gen to create a pattern. Now I'm going to change the data type on both of them. Let's, uh, let's set them both to PRBS 7 to begin with. There it is. Now they're set to PRBS 7. It's now resetting them. And voila. Let's see. Now it's refreshing. Let me see if the there you go. So you can see, remember, I have loopbacks on the FPGA. Because I have loopbacks, this is able to create a link and tell me if the link is act active. So on the first MG2, which is the first uh, transceiver, the transceiver is sending data at 3.125 gigabit per second. The bit error rate is zero because it's not making any mistakes. And you can see that it's generating a PRBS7. On the second one, I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm generating PRBS7 and the data rate is at 3.125 gigabit per second as well. So the, both of the links are active. Now, remember what you're expecting. You're expecting to see something like this. Now let's go back to the oscilloscope and take a look at it. I'm gonna pose some extra question for you guys to think about. I have turned off the EGA oscillators. So there's no EGA oscillator right now. And this is what I'm seeing on the scope. Okay, so the, there is no mixer LO. You can tell me why I see that. Okay, I want you to think about it and tell me why I see this pattern here. Now I'm going to turn the LOs on. And here we are. I hope you recognize this because it is exactly what I drew on the paper. Take a look at it. I told you we will have double sideband data of PRBS around the first LO. Then I said we will have double sideband data around the second LO and I told you there will be some other things which are the result of the imperfections of the system take a look at this it's even lining up perfectly here's the first one here's your double sideband PRBS sequence around the first LO here's the second one here's your second uh, PRBS data around your second LO and these are other things again I leave it up to you to tell me what these other things are but this is the one, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I'm interested. Believe it or not, my 1010 patterns coming from the oscilloscope are really in here somewhere, uh, trapped and upconverted by these two tones. Now, if I look at the time domain signal, let me for a moment turn off the FFT, turn on the time domain signal. Oh, I was actually clipping it, so I should do that FFT again just so you can see the, there we go, it's a little bit better. So let me turn this off, so it's actually more clean, so you can even see it better. So again, I pose yet another question to you. Why did the clipping cause the spectrum to look like that? And I want you to think about this because these are all DSP concepts that you need to really understand to appreciate what's happening. So think about that too. So you can see something here. I want you to tell me what that is. I see something here. Tell me what that is also, and these two are of course what I showed here. You can even see the second lumps, which are the little ones that I drew, they actually are there. And you can see one tone here, one tone here very clearly, there's another tone here, there's another tone there. You have to think about what each of those things are. I want you to consider them very carefully and discuss them on the website. But here we go, here we go. So we see the full spectrum starting from DC, stopping at 62.5 gigahertz, tons of data here, tons of information there. So let me turn the FFT off. Here we go, turn the signal on. And this is our signal in the time domain. Really, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> there is too much stuff on this that you cannot really, uh, you cannot really tell what is going on because it's multiple things up converted. But the result of all of that is of course the FFT that we saw. Oops. What did I do? Um, this is correct. There we go. There it is. So, 
Now what I want to do is I want to capture this signal in time domain because this is just the magnitude of the FFT. The phase information is not being displayed here. But I need the phase information in order to be able to completely demodulate the signal at the very end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now turn the FFT off again for a moment. I'm going to set, go under acquisition and I'm going to capture a whole lot of data. I'm going to put this on manual. I'm going to capture a lot of data, let's say um, 100 million points. At full sampling rate, I'm going to allow the scope to do its own interpolation. That's fine. It's not going to make much of a difference. And I'm going to enable the channel, and I'm going to do a single, con single capture, which, uh, which it just did. There it is. There's 100 million points completely captured. I can view it all. Uh, all at once, come on, it's now processing, there it is, there is a, this, this is a hundred million points worth of data at 160 giga samples per second with 62.3 uh, gigahertz of bandwidth. In here, I have my two 3.125 gigabit per second PRBS sequences that are within this, plus the LO leakage, plus all the other stuff that we saw there. I'm going to save this file now. I'm going to take it to the computer, and then we're going to take the FFT on it on the computer, and then reverse it back and get our PRBS sequences out, which would be amazing, because this is exactly what I was talking about when I was talking about a software-defined radio with remarkable bandwidth. So I have captured the data from the oscilloscope and I've brought it onto the computer and I've imported it into MATLAB. And I've also written a whole bunch of MATLAB code. You can see here that I have prepared to process the data and do the down conversion and filtering and everything that's necessary to recover our PRBS data back. Now, I'm not going to go through the code with you step by step, but I'm going to show you step by step what the code does and its effect on the signal itself. So let's run the code and see what it does. So the very first thing the code is going to display to you is just a raw captured data from the oscilloscope as a function of time. So the axis here is a function of time. So I've captured about 2 times 10 to the minus 7 seconds of data, which corresponds to 2 to the 15 samples, about 32,768 samples. I'm going to work with these uh, data and start uh, doing my processing on it. Now, if you look at this data, as I mentioned before, you're not going to recognize anything because it's up convert it's two up converter PRBS sequences, 20 gigahertz and 40 gigahertz. So of course, you're not going to see anything. It's completely unrecognizable. But in the frequency domain, it's much more meaningful. So let's take the FFT of that. Here we go. Again, we've seen this before too because the oscilloscope does get does give us an FFT function of the captured data. The only difference here is that because I'm taking FFT of a real signal, there is going to be a complex conjugate components in the frequency domain and that complex conjugate component shows up in the magnitude as a mirror image so this is just a mirror image of this frequency we don't really need this we can always replace it later so I'm going to get rid of that but you're going but you recognize this before we saw this on the oscilloscope screen here's the first allo here's the second allo and you can see our up converted double sideband mixer data around each of the allos so since we're going to try and recover our prbs data from the first allo and our prbs data from the second allo uh, we should replicate this so we can work on two copies of this individually get rid of the image data and then go from there so that's what i'm going to do next here we go so i've cut out the mirror image of the spectrum. Now I have two copies of this. Here's the first upper sideband. Here's the uh, here's the first up conversion. Here's the second up conversion, and they're of course all together. Now remember that this goes from zero to 80 gigahertz, and here, right there, where there's a huge drop, that's the bandwidth of the oscilloscope itself. And the oscilloscope, of course, filters everything after 62.3 gigahertz because it can't capture it. Therefore, it filters it for you digitally, so you don't have any more noise in that component. So here is outside the scope's bandwidth. That's why it drops so rapidly. And this is within the scope's bandwidth. Now, the first thing that I need to do is to identify my LOs. Now, I'm going to use a trick to do that. And the trick is to take advantage of the LO leakage. Remember, LO leakage is undesired. You don't want your LO to leak through so much that you can see it like this right up here. But I'm going to take, take advantage of that LO leakage and I'm going to use that to find where my down conversion frequencies should be. So the next thing my code is going to do, and if you pay close attention to these little circles, it's going to identify them. 
here we go so it put a little black circle and black star inside it and a black star here it tells me that my code successfully detected my low LO and my high LO values and it's going to use those to perform all of its filtering and down conversion now remember again these are double sideband mixers and I'm going to choose to keep the upper sideband data from each of the mixers so I'm going to choose this portion I could also choose this it's just easier to work with the upper sideband data from for both of them so I'm going to isolate the upper sideband data from the first LO and the upper sideband data from my second LO and I'm going to filter everything else because everything else is undesired all these guys are, are useless I'm going to filter them all out and only keep the upper sideband from the low LO and the high LO so let me do that next here we go so this is exactly the same as before again it goes from 0 to 80 gigahertz but now I have set everything to minus 50 dB which is really low and you can see everything else very very clearly here uh, you can see this is the upper sideband data of the lower LO and this is the upper sideband data of the higher LO and this is of course again I'm gonna put this paper right here this guy is this data right here which I was hoping to capture except it's still up converted around 20 gigahertz and this little guy is of course this one which is still up converted around now 40 gigahertz and you can see 20 gigahertz here and 40 gigahertz here so the next step would be to do down conversion all I've done so far is to filter it remember I need to bring these guys back to DC in order to recover my data in my in my PRBS data in the time domain so that's the next step of the code voila that's what it does I have brought it down to DC on both of them now this is my first PRBS sequence this is my second PRBS sequence now they kinda look like what they're supposed to look like uh, uh, from the beginning but again this is only if I want to get a real signal in the time domain I need to create the image uh, signal again the complex conjugate image so the code does that as well here we go that's just a mirror image like it was before now we're back to uh, at the correct frequency settings in order to get our time domain signal back and let's do that here we go and now this is the inverse FFT of what we just saw and it is in the time domain and take a look you can see your bits we got our ones and zeros from our PRBS sequence back it's almost like magic and if, if you pay close attention remember this is a PRBS 7 sequence a PRBS 7 sequence has only 2 to the 7 minus 1 bits so it repeats very very periodically very quickly and we can we can see that if you pay, pay close attention you can see there's kind of a repetition from here to here to here to here and to here and if I zoom in to this portion of the code you should be able to see that very clearly take a look at this you recognize look at this pattern this guy this guy and this big bit or this long bit I should say here here and here so you can clearly see the repetition pattern of 2 to the 7 minus 1 but you don't have to take my word for it we can actually measure it we can put a marker here whoops right here and we can put a marker right here now if you look this marker is at 1.441 e to the minus 7 seconds and this is at 1 0.035 e to the minus 7 seconds if you subtract these two numbers from each other you're going to get the time it takes for the PRBS sequence to repeat itself and it matches perfectly to how long it should take for 3.125 gigabit per second PRBS 7 sequence to repeat itself take these two numbers subtract them and convince yourself that that's the case so it will take 1 over 3.125 gigahertz times 127 minus 1 for a PRBS 7 sequence to repeat itself and that's exactly the difference between these two time components so we have in fact indeed have recovered a PRBS sequences very nicely now this waveform oh, let me put this back here now this waveform looks much nicer than the waveform at the bottom but rest assured this has exactly the same properties just that this one is a little bit more noisy because it was in the upper uh, frequency so I couldn't filter it very well but this again I will check to verify this and this indeed is also a PRBS7 and it matches perfectly and we have recovered both of them simultaneously independently from the original spectrum and we can see that this is exactly oops this is exactly what we wanted to do and get our data back 
So it's, uh, it may look like magic, but really all it is is uh, some DSP processing. And with, because of the remarkable bandwidth that we have from the oscilloscope, we are able to do this crazy type of uh, signal processing directly on the data that comes from the oscilloscope. Well, I hope that you enjoyed the experiments that I did with the oscilloscope and you learned something new. If you're interested to learn more about it, definitely check out Agilent's website. I know that this is not something that everybody's going to buy, but it's very cool to see what are its capabilities and what it can do, and also what the edge of the technology is and the advancements we've made into manufacturing instead of the art test equipment. And if you have any questions, post it online. Let's discuss some of the things that I said and discuss some of the questions that I raised, and hopefully we can get some interesting uh, discussions going on. Well, at this point, there is really only one other thing to do, and that's to create the world's most expensive Netflix setup box. So, let's do that. Here we go. Fantastic. So, until next time.